Hello, and welcome to The Eternal Quest. I'm Paul Meyer. Did you know that the first astronomers were actually astrologers? It's a curious fact that up until the age of reason, astrology, science, and religion were very closely intertwined. Then, as author and astrologer Alice O'Howell observed, science lost its sense of the sacred, and religion lost its proof. Astrology has been a poor outcast ever since. However, during the last 60 to 75 years, thanks mainly to the work of Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, astrology has entered a new age of interest and investigation. Alice O'Howell is our guest on today's program, one which probes the relationship between psychology and astrology. Ms. Howell is the author of two quest books on astrology, and she discusses her pioneering work with Ray Grassi, assistant editor of Quest magazine and an astrologer himself. Together they explore the symbiotic relationship between Jungian psychology and astrological charts. An astrologer for nearly 50 years, Ms. Howell is a former faculty member of the C.G. Jung Institutes of Chicago and Los Angeles. She's also an award-winning poet. Alice, most people have associated astrology with fortune telling, especially people that have read the newspaper or astrology columns. But astrologers like yourself have tried to show that there's a more psychological or more inward aspect to astrology. Could you say a few words about that? Well, I, I sometimes like to use the analogy of, let's say, what um, a c cartoon on a bubblegum wrapper would be to Shakespeare would be what you read in the newspapers about astrology to what uh, astrology really is. And of course, the history of the world and the history of astrology kind of go in tandem. And uh, astrology was very respectable up until the age of rationalism. And uh, then both science and religion repudiated astrology. But at the time that this happened, uh, I kind of think that science lost its sense of the sacred and religion lost its proofs. What is it about Carl Jung's psychology that is especially compatible with what astrology has to say? That's a very good question. Because Jung speaks of archetypal components to the psyche. Contents. Mm -hmm. Archetypal contents are in the psyche. Yeah. And the archetypal contents he speaks of are the same processes that you find in the chart in, the, in terms of the planets. For example? Well, all right, for example, let's say somebody with um, a, a, a father complex. Uh, you very often will find, as you know, in looking at a chart, that the chart will have perhaps the sun conjunct Saturn or, or, or the sun squared by Saturn. There's usually a sun-Saturn relationship in there. Uh -huh. And Jung uh, said, at the heart of every complex is a god. What, and, does, that, what does that mean? Well, wh what he means is at the heart of every complex is what we would call an archetypal process which equals uh, a god because these these processes were universal therefore divine and they were then given names and uh, eventually forms and so now we have to deliteralize if you will the gods and goddesses, or as processes that are to be found in the outer world and also within the inner world of the psyche. So that if, if you can see, let's say, your outer life as a looking glass of circumstance that reflects back to you the way you are likely to process experience. Hmm. And for me, that's what a chart is. It's a description of the way a person is likely the process experience. Huh. And just as DNA and RNA 
uh, do that for the body, the chart is a template of the way we tend to process experience. The paradox is that every single chart has the same ingredients. Nobody misses out on anything. We all have exactly the same ingredients, but every chart is unique because there's only one you and only one me, and so we're all variations on, on a theme. And so if the chart is a description of the way we are likely to process experience, that it is we see who we are. And the reason astrology can be so helpful to uh, therapy and to psychology is that the next step, because we process experience unconsciously, whether you believe in astrology or not, that chart is describing the way you are likely to process experience. But somehow spirit in its wisdom has given us the option to be conscious of how we do this. And the chart makes it objective so that you suddenly say, well, now I see uh, how, in, how I normally react to situations. I don't have to react to situations this way. And this is where the alchemy comes in within the psyche. You can change your attitude by becoming conscious. I think one of the complexes that probably is the most common to all human beings, and that is the inferiority complex. Well, if you know that this is typical of the way you react and the way you process experience, the next time that this happens, you can say, aha, this is the Virgo part of me. I don't have to process the experience this negatively, or else what I do, since I never seem to get rid of it, is just surrender it. And Jung says of complexes, he's, first of all, he says, be grateful that you have them, because if you didn't have them, life would be a drag. <laughs> That's the opus we have to work on. And he said a complex can be dissolved, but it has to be drunk to the very last drag. And then, which means to be fully conscious of what the issue is, and then apply it. I used to think, by the way, that if you just understood it, and were conscious of it, you got off scot-free. No. Oh. <laughs> no sooner have you think that you understood it, you're tested. Life comes along and tests you. Huh. Can you see how, if the chart is describing certain problems and places that we need to learn something, we attract them. And it's, it's amazing how we do attract them. So I don't know if you'd call that destiny or something, but it's simply that the way we perceive whatever our complex is, is what we project onto the world. And so we keep running into that looking glass of circumstance until we become conscious and then can heal and reapply the, the lesson learned. And then life serves up the next one. <laughs> what is that quote of Jung's about how if we don't work on something inwardly, it'll manifest externally as Yes, fate. that's exactly the, what he said. And he said it not only in terms of individuals, but in terms of history and, and uh, um, wars and, you know, the whole history of mankind uh -huh. is uh, at a collective level suffering the same, the same thing. So that whatever we refuse to work on within is served up to us outwardly as fate. But very often you can by working on something within the psyche, um, not have to suffer it quite so dramatically in outer life. And usually people come to astrologers, I think, in crisis or in despair or, 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 or enter analysis for help. And I do not believe that astrologers have the responsibility for working on the psyche. I think that astrology should be uh, uh, somehow an adjunct to psychotherapy. Mm. And so it would make me happy if more psychologists, psychiatrists, and analysts understood the function of astrology. A doctor will send 
a person to have an x-ray. The x-ray cannot heal the bone or the fracture or the trauma, right? Yeah. But it can help and guide the doctor immediately to seeing where the problem is. What is the problem? And time and time again, I have had clients come to me and say, I have learned more in this hour about myself than eight years of um, analysis. In this case, it was not a Jungian analyst. It was another form of analysis. But the psyche is limitless. In yeah. other words, all an astrologer or an analyst, for that matter, can do is point to things, but the, the free will lies in each individual having absolutely um, free will in becoming more conscious and growing closer and closer to being a whole person. And that, that avenue is open to everybody. So it's not a definition. That would mean to limit, right? Yeah. But a description. It's like a treasure map to individuation. Would you agree with the definition that some astrologers have suggested that the chart shows the personality but not the spirit? No. No. How would you? No. <laughs> I wouldn't. That's, that's selling it short. No, 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 no. The chart, I think, and I, I know I, you could find fault with me, uh, but I really feel that there is something holy about a chart mm -hmm. and that its purpose is to help us to come closer to God's purpose for us. I have never felt in any way that astrology diminished my religious or spiritual sense. If anything, it opened up a thousand times more uh, in that direction. And I Ray get a little bit upset, to say the least, about the kind of astrology that I see people getting into that has so much to do with statistics and with the validity of trying to prove and prove and prove. And I feel that this is astrology that is ego identified. In other words, it's these scientific types are so concerned with the proof that they're missing the purpose. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, at the level of the ego, it is always going to remain a mystery of exactly how and why. And statistics are not going to prove a damn thing. And it's, it invalidates the dignity of the human spirit and of, of our purpose in being in this world. And I, uh, I feel that the the chart should lead us closer to an understanding of the indwelling divine guest and not to um, being points in statistics. Mm -hmm. I think that's cheapening the purpose of astrology. You've talked a lot about how astrology can be applied on not only the personal level but the collective global level as well. How would you explain that? Well, for many, many years, I studied history and taught history. And uh, again, uh, I began to notice. <laughs> That's the next step, is kind of noticing these correlations. And I realized how much is being said of the New Age, and, and I began to understand about the point of the vernal equinox, and, uh, and that, of course, there were other ages. And Jung gets involved, uh, he wrote, extensively on the age of Pisces, and he mentions a little bit about the age of Aries. And if you go back, which is what I've tried to do in, in this book, is to show how every one of these great ages coincides with a religious expression, and that the symbols used by the religion tie in with the nature of the constellation hosting the vernal equinox. It's, it's mind-blowing, but it works. Let's back up a bit. What are the ages for those people that may not be familiar with the ages we're talking well, about? Well, the, the astrological ages are a great cosmic clock. That it's an astronomical, not an astrological fact. That at the moment of spring, let's say, if you take a celestial ruler 
and you line up the Earth and the Sun, and you, you, you draw a line out to the constellations. The constellations are the fixed visible stars, right? Mm -hmm. You know this better than I. <laughs> this, is, this is my clumsy way of describing it. But this is like the, 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 the hour hand on a clock. And it goes, it retrogrades through the signs. And each one of these ages is approximately 2,300 years, give or take the width of the constellation. And it moves 72 years to one degree. Mm -hmm. So that the complete platonic year is something like 26,000 and something. Something like something that. Like that. And so, right now, we hear so much about entering the New Age, and people are so sick of the New Age that, you know, we haven't really even begun the New Age, got 2,000 years of it, and you can't do away with it either, because it's coming. It's astronomical, not astrological. And so I thought it was, it was time that a book could, or, or to describe uh, the correlation, as it were, of the evolution of the collective unconscious through these ages. But one of my favorites uh, is the age of Taurus, because if you study the age of Taurus, which was roughly 4,000 to 1,800 BC, thereabouts, give or take, right, 500 years interface for each, um, what was worshipped then? Bulls. Yeah, and you, that's a lot of bull. <laughs> there were bulls in Crete, in Assyria, in Greece, in China, in Egypt, in uh, the Celtic world. And Joseph Campbell, in, in, in one of his books, says, why the bull? Well, this was the age of Taurus, is the bull. Now, what symbolically does that stand for? Well, the characteristics of Taurus have to do with agriculture and with possessions and with having. And 4000 BC was the beginning of what we call civilization, which means that you have a city. You can't have a city without having enough protein and starch to support the people in a city. So. When cities first emerged in India and Egypt and Mesopotamia and in China, uh, they all had agriculture. That is, crops that were being rotated, you know, and consciously planted and yeah. so forth. So Taurus rules agriculture. It also rules possessions. And if you have a field, let's say you're an old Egyptian farmer and you have a field, um, you've planted the seeds, what would be the next thing you'd be likely to do? Fertilize. And what makes crops grow? Water. That's right. So you want rain, rain and you want sun. No locusts, please. So what you do is you pray. You pray to the gods to favor your fields. Now, when we pray over something, psychologically, we are spending psychic energy. And whatever we spend psychic energy on, we think we own. And that's a fact. Hmm. And so the idea, then, of owning a field, nomads don't own things. They just travel through. Yeah. <laughs> They're hunters. But agricultural people want to own. It's my field. And pretty soon they get together, and it's my county, and it's my country, and it's my nation. And then comes the, the funny thing, is that owning, people owned cattle. And the word capitalism come, and cattle are cognate words. Did you know that? <laughs> no. And the, Capitalism comes from kaput, meaning head. How many heads of steer and cattle do you have? Huh. And what do we conduct our business? <laughs> the stock market. And we even use the term to be bullish on the market. Hmm. 
So all these are funny little, you never get bored if you're an astrologer. Oh God, it's such fun. <laughs> Then what, what happened after the age of Taurus, when the age of Aries came in, did that have its own just Aries and Pisces? Indeed they all have their did. own Indeed it did, and the mythologies, you see, follow through. That when that shift took place, bulls were out and rams were in. And all the myths are of bull slayers. You know, there's Theseus and, and the, the, the Minotaur and... Um, the, this, the story of um, uh, Gilgamesh and uh, Moses Mithra and, the golden ca golden and well, Moses, of course, is the most famous of all uh, in the sense of, of uh, rejecting the old religion of the golden calf mm -hmm. and setting up altars with ram's horns and Judaism was the great, great religion of the age of Aries. Hmm. I mean, you'll see rams in Egypt, in, in uh, even the, the famous Gundestrup cauldron. It's fascinating. In India, everywhere bulls are out and rams are in. And the opposite constellation plays its part, because in the age of Aries, the opposite sign was, or constellation was Libra, which rules law as well as art. And between 18... 100 BC and the beginning of the Christian era, for the first time, collective laws, the Code of Hammurabi, the Twelve Tablets in Rome, um, the Ten Commandments, the Noble Eightfold Path. I mean, everywhere they began the, to have this great new idea that there should be collective laws for all people. It's also the time when Art first flourished, and Libra rules art, uh, it rules law, and if you think about it, if a thing is, if relationships are harmonious, then they are beautiful. If they are in proportion, they are beautiful. Right now we're on the verge between two ages, between Pisces and Aquarius. What does that mean in terms of where we're coming from and where we're going towards? Well, if the acquiring of the ego was a huge step in the age of Aries, then the lesson of the age of Pisces and the icon of the crucifixion is that of sacrificing the ego. which is a very painful thing. And it, you hear about the death of the ego. It doesn't have to die. It needs to be sacrificed so that it becomes devoted and, and useful and an instrument. Well, then comes the question, what happens next? Mm. Once the ego in an individual is sacrificed, it opens the way that we might begin to discover God within. And if that were the case, then heaven would be on earth. But we're a long way hmm. <laughs> from being that. But can you see how if people are identified with the ego, then God has to be out there, out in the heavens or paradise or somewhere, but wherever it is, it's out. And the ego is scared. We're scared because we just don't understand. And we cannot understand, but we can, we can feel. And so it's a 180 degree turn, I think. And all the signs are already there. And the traps. I mean, the brotherhood of man, the, the uh, idea of freedom, of space travel, I mean, or of unisex, of, you know, the balancing of masculine and feminine, all these things are there, but there's a terrible trap. What's that? The trap, I think, is depersonalization. We are so mechanized that we're becoming numbers, social security numbers, you know, cases or whatever. We're losing the dignity of the human soul. And we make these huge scientific and technological leaps, and, and sometimes we leave uh, the preciousness of the human soul behind. That's dangerous. And so we have Social Security as an example. 
uh, people get a social security check. But there's no love in the envelope. And so when there's a crisis, a blackout or something, people go out and loot. There's no love there. There's no caring because there's no human touch in all the healing professions and so forth. When you reduce uh, a, a human being to a ca being a case. Now, every doctor who talks about a patient as a case, every teacher who talks about a pupil as a case, is having an I-it relationship and not an I-thou relationship. So the trap for the age of Aquarius is that we become so objective that we become desensitized. Uh, I mean, in the good old days, there were fights. There were duels. At least you knew who you were fighting and why you were fighting. But today, someone will drive down daily on the news. They're going down the road in a car, bang, you're dead. Don't take it personally, bang, you're dead. People shoot each other, kill each other without any particular idea in mind. That's dangerous. Hmm. Collective death is uh, a devaluing of human life. So we're entering a, a period of tremendous danger. And Mother Teresa said it best. She said, I believe in person to person and that God is in everyone. Now, the Aquarian might easily, glibly say, I believe that God is in everyone, and forget the person to person. This. Yeah. This is what. The hugs to the left and the hugs to the right, the actual personal honoring of an individual.